Okay. Now what do we do? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's start. Huh? Yeah, let's I get guess. started. Yeah, let's get started. So, the thing is that... Um, what's your name? Louis. Louis. Louis Brawley. Brawley. Brawley, as in brawling all the time. <laughs> Good. That's what somebody told me. Yeah, what, what I'm going to talk about is um, is a man that I met years and years ago. Mm. Uh, he was from India, and somebody told me he's a kind of guru, and I wasn't really all that interested in gurus. I said, no, this one you should really see. Mm. And uh, I came there, there were quite some people there, and he was sitting there, and I was totally amazed by the way he was talking about the things that gurus mostly talk about. He was very uh, tough, and uh, people were amazed because it's all about love. And he said, love is a four-letter word, he said. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And I was, I was really, I was really quite excited about this man. I said, wow, he's, he's taking all those things that we are so stuck with, that we are so grown up with, and that we have to do in order to be enlightened or whatever. Yeah. He throws them out, you know what I mean? And he, he, um, yeah, he, he changed uh, my whole way of thinking in a way. And later I met him. And immediately I interviewed him, and I have made, I think, four or five interviews with him, and just listening to him, and he was quite amazed because he said, you're the only one that I can talk with, because most people attack me, you know, or go in, def in, in the defense mode, mm. because they can barely believe what I'm saying, you know. And uh, you met him too, huh? Mm. And you spent quite some time with him. Yeah. So when did you meet him for the first time? 2002, and uh, it was in a hotel room in New York. Uh, and I'd read all of his books online before meeting. He never wrote books, huh? No, but he there were re, re, people. People there were were records of his discussions with other yeah. people. But this was one of the things that interested me about him. But yeah. He didn't write a book. No. It like even my previous obsession was with Jiddu Krishnamurti. Oh, the Krishnamurti who grew up here in Holland. Yeah, sir, that's the one. Yeah. Well, he didn't grow up here. No, but he I certainly mean, he, spent some time here. He spent quite some time. He had a castle here. somewhere locally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which he allegedly gave back, but anyway. Yeah. So I grew up with that guy, sort of. This is what got me into this messy business of this so called seeking. And uh, he was writing very poetic journals about the otherness and things like this. And this Yuji character uh, was saying nasty things about himself. That meditation was... A, and uh, the reason that I connected with Yuji was because of the last name, Krishnamurti, or whatever this yeah, name. Right. But they were, of course, not related. But I was... I, I thought initially, cynically, I thought, here's a guy, he's probably a relative. And he's probably trying to get in on the business. Yeah, yeah. The big guy's already set up this whole empire. Yeah. And now here he comes, this punk kid. He's going to get a little action out of it. So I read his books only out of cynicism. And very quickly I was taken aback by, first of all, in the first book that I read, online for free, was that there was no copyright on any of these books. No. The material. And that immediately got my attention. I thought, well, usually that's not the case. I mean, everything is copyrighted. And then there was no... Jiddu always spoke about no guru, no teacher, no... But there were schools and institutions and exactly. all this stuff. But I thought, well, the guy was... Whatever, he was trying to help people. Yeah. Then this Yuji character points out... He says, no teacher, no teaching, no taught. And then he goes out there and sets up institutions and schools. And this rang a bell also, because by this time, I had been informed of the fact that Jiddu, who, who turns out was human, for a long time I thought he was some very special, elevated being, because he in, insinuated 
in all of his behavior that he was celibate. Whereas I discover that he had an affair with his best friend's wife for 20 some years. <laughs> Which I thought, well, I know who cares if he's fucking around, but why is he then saying... He's celibate. No, he says, the thought of sex never even enters my head. Oh yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> what does it enter? I mean, maybe he will... So, he never said anything in favor of marriage, and he never said don't have affairs, but he insinuated many things about himself which were not true in the end. But the bigger, in a way, criticism um, for me was when I read that he set up these schools, and I thought, yeah, because when I went to see Jiddu speak, I was very disappointed. Because here's a guy on a stage, and he's way down there, and I can't talk to him, I can't approach him. Then this Yuji character is, is saying that he met that guy and he had long conversations with him at the end of which he said, what is happening here? You know, you tell me that there's nothing you can do, so why do you give these talks? Anyway, the impression that I got from Yuji, I was told it was the same kind of thing that JK was saying, basically. But it was radically different from what JK said initially. And the effect of it was to erase the obsession with Judo Christian Ray for me. But of course it was immediately replaced by an obsession with who is this Yuji character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I had to go to a hotel room in New York to meet the guy. He 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 stayed there or he gave it He was in town. I I actually was in touch with someone through the website, which is how I heard of him. And uh, this person gave me a telephone number. And I called the telephone number hoping for information about where he might give a talk or something. And when I called the phone number, a woman answered. And then she said, well, would you like to speak with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of strange. You just speak directly with him? Yeah. yeah. Certainly if you called Jiddu, you'd only get a recording or a secretary or something. Yeah. Right. You're not going to get in the same room. No. Well, she put Yuji on the phone. And I, I was very taken aback, but I said, you know, he said, who is this? I said, my name is Lewis, and I'm, I'm a, what you would refer to as a JK freak. But I have somehow, by reading your books for free online, I feel this enormous relief, and I just wanted to thank you. And he laughed, and I laughed. And that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> because people said also he's a gruff, tough guy, and you'll never, you know, and I thought, well, I'm just curious. If somebody can say what he's saying in these books, I want to see this guy. Yeah. Somehow, I mean, there's so much bullshit out there. And I have very little patience. And until I encountered his, um, whatever, his expression... I had not seen any contemporary outside of Jiddu Krishnamurti who really impressed me initially because he wasn't quoting someone else. He was speaking for himself. Whether or not he was honest, I don't know now. But yeah. Jiddu was not quoting other people. No. And I liked what he was getting at, but he didn't go far enough, I guess. Yeah, he was quite famous. He was quite famous, but beyond that, what he was saying was not dependent on dogma. What I didn't realize with it, it was that he had turned himself into a dogma. But I didn't know that until I saw someone who was free of dogma. Yeah. I mean, so when I, when I was, when I went into the room with Yuji Krishnamurti, I was across the street from where I first saw J.K. speak at Madison Square Garden Auditorium. So. Some near 20 years before. Yeah. After paying maybe $20 to, for a ticket. Yeah. I walk into a hotel room with about six, eight people sitting around and a little old man on the couch. I don't pay a nickel to walk in there. Right. And I get a meal out of it and I go home totally confused. Uh, these two people, the way they operate is radically different. Yeah, absolutely. One guy's charging money and telling you not to have a guru while he's sitting up on the stage. Yeah. Inaccessible, like all gurus. And the other guy is saying, there is no such thing as a guru. There's not only that, there's no such thing as enlightenment. Thought is a, your enemy, you know, uh, what is it? the mind is a myth, or <laughs> all yeah. of these things. But 
the impression that I had of this person was of someone who was completely, uh, well, he was quite baffling, actually, initially. I was, yeah. Because it was so um, vulnerable. He was very unprotected in the sense, you know, he wasn't, he had nothing to pitch. He was talking nonsense, actually. He was talking, he was telling me stories that he would tell. And they seemed absurd to me. They seemed unrelated. And I kept waiting for him to get to the point. Yeah, yeah. Get right. to the point, Eugene. And then I can and I was waiting to ask a question. I was desperate to ask him a question. Something relevant. And when I finally started to launch my question, he chopped me off at the legs. That's not your question. You just you've been asking I how many people have crossed my threshold who have that same question that's not your question. You don't I couldn't even get it out of my mouth. And I thought, well, what am I supposed to do? You know. So I just sat down and thought, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, but I'm <laughs> going to wait until the next chance for me to ask a question. Yeah. Which you know. What kind of question did you want to ask? I think it was about okay. You're saying all these things about how there's no enlightenment, there's no nothing, but you're in a state you're different than I am. That's what I wanted to say, but I couldn't even get that much out. He was chopping me, chopping me, chopping. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't, 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 just shut up. It was more or less like, just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> you sit down and shut up. Yeah. And leave. But somehow I knew he didn't mean it. The, yeah. le the leaving part. Yeah, I, I, I once was in a, in a meeting with him, and uh, he said to somebody, uh, uh, "You better get out, otherwise I call the police." Yeah. <laughs> like that. People were totally shocked, indeed. Yeah. But there were people, I think, who he could get rid of without saying a word. Yeah. I mean, by being what he was, he yeah. eliminated 99% of people to begin with. Yeah. He just had, because he had no, nothing to offer, and he was not selling anything. No. And we're so used to being sold yeah. false comfort that when the real material comes across, it's so frightening that people leave the room immediately. Yeah. They call it cynicism, they call it whatever they want, but they will immediately excuse themselves from that so they yeah. don't have to deal with it, I think. Yeah, exactly. You know, and people say, oh, you're talking that way because he was your guru and he's your... And I, there's nothing I can do about that crap that people want to launch, you know, about how, why, you know, why do you even talk about it? Why do you say anything about it? Well, if you've seen the most amazing thing you could imagine, then you're going to walk around with your lips zipped. You know, that's not possible for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, because he, by, my instincts were, through most of my life, that most of what I encountered as an artist, as a so-called, you know, seeker of religious truths or spiritual, 99% of what I encountered was bullshit. It was not operating, it was not accessible, or it didn't work, or it was a cheap pitch. Or it just didn't, you know, JK's choiceless awareness or, you know, whatever. With the art world's promise that the artist is revealing secret truths of the universe. That's bullshit. Yeah. You know, all these things are bullshit. They're sales pitches. And I finally was in the room with another human being who said, they're bullshit, they're sales pitches. And I felt incredibly relieved. Yeah, right. That was, the sensation was of relief. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, somebody else who sees through this. Yeah. Um... And of course, I wanted to spend more time with someone like that. That's really what it was. So when people launch all this guru talk, I mean, of course, you you feel attracted toward people who have a similar, whatever, uh, inclination maybe. But also, the the guy had the kind of energy of a wild animal. I mean, he had a, he had he was completely untamed. Yeah. At the same time, ultimately civilized, polite. Knew how to proceed, you know. He knew how to behave. He wasn't interested in breaking the laws. No, right. At all. That no. didn't interest him. It wasn't necessary. He just was not caught up with all these things somehow, the way I was. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, most of us are, you know. Yeah. So that's the way we have been uh, trained, you know, to it's be. The circumstances of our existence. Yeah make this almost impossible not to be. Yeah, exactly. So you say, you say teachers for about 20 years until they're an automatic pilot and yeah. then 
Mm -hmm. It starts with your family. Yeah. And then it continues with the educational system. Yeah. And then the final stamp is you enter the work world and you become a whore for the rest of your yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or you're shunned out, or you're rich enough to to indulge yourself in all the things that people who are bored do to keep from going insane. Yeah. 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 So true. And then there's for me too for the first time a man who doesn't follow that pass at all, you know, he... No, but what's fascinating about him is that you sensed that he had been down that road. I think it's one of the, one sure. of the wonderful things about you, she was that he, he did all these things. Yes. I think he, he, one of the lines that really hooked me in his, in, in the mystique of enlightenment was when he said, they tell me that I'm supposed to be a gentle, meek, kind person, and I'm a monster. Yeah. I'm filled with rage. Something is wrong with this picture. Yeah. And I thought, that's me. He's describing me. I've been meditating. I've been doing all these therapies. I'm trying to improve myself. And in the end, I'm an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So what good did all that do? Yeah. It does leave you with that question. Yeah. I have seriously in investigated these possibilities. And yeah. I'm still caught in this bullshit. What's going on here? And then for me, because of that, because I had been trying for myself, when I walked in and saw someone who had resolved that in themselves, whatever that means, whatever he was, those things were no longer the issue for him. I felt that more than I could. I can't prove these things to anybody. No. There's, there's no point trying, but I knew it when I saw him. Yeah. You look at someone, you look them in the eye and you can see, Something is missing there. <laughs> <laughs> missing or present, I don't know which. And I really, I thought he was crazy at first. A little yeah. bit. I was worried that he was senile. Yeah. Yeah, I have I've met many people who think so. But I, would, yes, I remember having that thought. Idiots, yeah. And then he looked, picked me out in the room and said, Hi, what's sir? Huh? How are you doing back there? I hardly knew the guy. and he, But he, the radar was unbelievable. Yeah. It was just a dead on. So, after spending... How long were you in that hotel room with him? Oh, the first day I spent all day. All day? All day. And then I went home. And the six people who were there too were... Everyone was sitting there and I thought, what the hell are we doing here? And why is he going on and on like this? And he did, of course, say the reason you're here is because that book didn't do the job. If the book had done the job that you said you read, you wouldn't have come here. So yeah. I went home in a dilemma. Okay, so I shouldn't go back, right? He's telling me I shouldn't go back. I shouldn't bother this guy. What is it? Why am I bothering him? I should leave him alone. So I stayed at home the next day. I stayed at home. <laughs> I stayed at home and I thought, God damn it. There's, I can't not go back there. And so the next day, he was in New York for about a week, I don't know. Every day after that, I went there. And we went to the mall, and we went and did things that I would find as an artist in New York, an anathema. To go to a mall in New Jersey for coffee with some random group of people that I have nothing in common with. Yeah. Why the hell am I doing this? Yeah. Because I wanted to see if this guy was for real. Yeah, right. And there was something about his whole, the whole thing that had this funny sense about it. It's this unfettered, you know, what, what, why is it that J.K. was charging money? And why was he fooling around? And here's a guy who says all that is crap, but he doesn't charge me to sit and talk to him. No. And he looks, he acts in a very interesting way. You know, yeah. He has a he has a quality about him that I cannot put my finger on. Let me figure this out. So I would observe how he moved. You know, how does he? What does he? How does he respond to things and people? And I joked with him. You know, because I'm a wise ass. I joked with him, and he nothing bothered him at all. No, no, nothing. right, right. Because I thought if if something bothers him, maybe that'll be a, a hint that he's yeah, right. You know, maybe he's holding something back. Nothing. No, so and I think it was the first day, maybe the first day, that he actually went into his little room and brought out a folder to share with me. And he said, 
and I want to show you this picture. He looked like a little bad boy from the schoolyard. And you see, she gave me this picture of this image of a white elephant from some nature magazine with a huge erection. And it was having sex with this porn star woman. It had been photoshopped together, a collage. Oh, yeah. This thing. And she had this a face pasted on of the not a very attractive Asian looking woman's face on the on the porn star's body. He explained the whole thing to me this way. He said, This is the story of the Buddha's mother, is that a white elephant entered the Buddha's when he would, you know, he had these great gestures. He would enter the the mother of the Buddha and, and I guess that was the impregnation of and she was a something or other and they weren't very good looking people, so that's the face is ugly, you know. And, uh, and there's a place in Sri Lanka called Kandy where they have the tooth, which is the elephant-sized tooth, and that's yeah. the proof of the story. And I was just listening to this, I'm like, what? <laughs> this is too funny. And he says, I sent this to the Dalai Lama on his mother's birthday because a best friend of mine is his secretary, and that guy doesn't like me anymore. And I said, well, no wonder. <laughs> well, if you're going to behave like this, it's no wonder. But I felt immediately like I really like this guy. Yeah. Because I never had any patience for the Dalai Lama. Somebody brown-nosing with movie stars in Hollywood, yeah. it just sticks in my craw. Yeah. I was never convinced by this. I mean, I, I feel bad that he got kicked out of his country. I'm sure he's a nice fellow, but he doesn't interest me one tiny little piece. No, it's I, like a hallmark card of spirituality. Who yeah. cares about this shit? Yeah. So I was quite relieved when Yuji shared this idiocy with me. <laughs> because also it was like right up my alley. It was very irresponsible. Or, you know, what do you call it? Irreverent. Irreverent. A little, little bit irresponsible. <laughs> and uh, I just liked it. I liked his attitude. And the fact that there was absolutely nothing going on there intrigued me. I said, he's hiding something. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. Yeah. So, I, and on the third moment, he left, of course. He went away. And, and then, and you lived in New York? I was living in New York, and I had just started to work freelance which gave me a freedom I had not had before in my life. I yeah. was working for galleries in New York and making more money per hour with less hours. And I would do a job installing art, a yeah. show in a gallery, get my money, and then be free for some time. Yeah. Right. So for the first time, you know, I had been obsessed with JK, as I mentioned, for years. And here's this guy, Yuji, and he's going to be in Switzerland. And I knew all about Sonnet, where JK gave the talks in the tent. And by now I also knew that Yuji had had some experience there that was very mysterious and strange. And so my friends were telling me uh, he's going to be there in the summer. So I thought, well, I'm going to save my pennies and I'm going to go to Switzerland and see this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went for two weeks. It seemed so exotic at the time. I'm going to Switzerland and I'm going to see this guy, you know. And, and um, I got there. And uh, I walked into the room and he said, oh, you again. <laughs> I walked into my friend and he said, oh, you've come all this way. For what? Why did you Why did you come all this way here? And I thought, yeah, I don't really know, actually, but here I am. <laughs> and, and, you know, the nonsense just went on from there. We was talking the same strange stories. <coughs> and uh, there were a couple in the back of the room, this French couple, and I was sitting toward the back because, frankly, I was a little baffled. You know, like, what is he, why is he going on and on? Yeah. But again, I, like I said, I couldn't, he had a quality which I couldn't shake. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. So they were saying, well, you know, Yuji used to give real discourses and now he stopped talking. And I thought, if somebody gets out of the mess, how can they not be fully out of the mess? How can you kind of go out and then come back? And is he is he really not talking? Is he really not teaching? I'm going to go right into the front row and I'm going to engage with him. I'm going to pester him with questions and I'm going to make him answer. Yeah. And so I went up to the front of the classroom, you know, and I started talking to him. I, I thought, I'm going to ask him about this whole business of headlessness that he described that happened in London, just to see what happened. 
So I start talking. Headlessness? Yeah, he, he at one point had an experience in around 63 or early 60s when he was in London where he said that he could no longer feel his head above his eyes. And he, where is my head gone? Where are my thoughts coming from? I don't understand any of this. I'm just telling you what was in the book, and I, I wanted to use this as a pretext yeah. to ask him, what do you mean by that? So I had that in, all right, I'll just do this as a means of getting information from him, of engaging with him. And so I started asking him about that. And it was really fascinating, because he was describing things, and then he would go off on a tangent, and then I would think, he's getting away here. He's, he, you know, the tiger is getting out of the cage. Right? Yeah. But how am I going to get him back? So I'd throw a chunk of meat in there. You know, he, but you said, and then he would kind of come all the way back around and talk about things. And I was asking him stuff. At one point, I think he said the sex urge was gone when I did this and this. And I said, well, what about masturbation? You're telling me you never masturbated? I mean, I was... I couldn't believe what I was saying to the guy. But yeah. again, I was thinking, if he has something to hide, then he'll get angry. Or yeah. if I've overstepped a line, then now there were no lines. There was no overstepping anything. I could say or ask anything I wanted. And so... And he that, never got angry. No, in fact, he was uh, very much available for anything. <laughs> there was no resistance. No. At, at all, to anything. Um... You know, in the future, if, if I saw him get what I would call angry, it was only if I was trying to impose something or say something premeditated. And this exchange I had with him was really crucial for me because it was about, okay, how does he function? How does this guy operate? What is it like to have a conversation with someone like that? What happens when you talk to them? Yeah. I can't, I didn't come away with any information that I could use or explain to somebody else, but I came away with the, the certainty that he was quite of his, you know, he wasn't crazy at all. In other sense, he wasn't failing mentally. No. He was sharp as a, he was sharper than I was, for yeah. sure. And the feeling was also like, here's a guy who's operating on, without trying, he can, he can handle any situation that I yeah. can throw at him which, you know, wasn't that much. So, I, again, I went away for after two weeks. So you spent two weeks with him? Two weeks that time. Then I went back to New York, and I worked, and then I booked a ticket to India where I knew he was going to be because I thought, I want to see what he's like. And he was old by the time I met him. And already you can tell probably that I was fascinated by the guy. And I thought, I don't know how long he's going to be around, but I, I really want to get more. I need to. I need more exposure to this yeah. guy. I need yeah. to find out more. So I booked a ticket to India. So. And, <laughs> you know, I had never. There were two places in the world that I was not interested in going in my life. Was he was he in India with his parents or so? Or so his parents were already dead. With his parents? Yeah, he, 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 he was born in India. He was born in India. His parents, actually, his mother died when he was an infant. Oh, that right. Yeah, and then his father left him. So his grandparents raised him. Yeah, yeah, his grandparents and raised him. And the grandfather was wealthy. Yeah. And a member of the Theosophical Society. Theosophical Society. Which was how the connection with Jiddu Krishnamurti occurred in his life. Yeah, because uh, the, he, the, he visited the house of his uh, grandfather. Yes. Well, actually, he... And Madame Blavatsky was there too, I remember. Well, Yuji met Jiddu Krishnamurti in the 40s, actually. Okay. He, he may have seen him on stage before that, but he officially met him in a small discussion group in Madras when, he, when Yuji was in his probably late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. And that, at that point, they had a... a well, Yuji describes it in some places, but there was there was a one-on-one -on -one exchange. The, the, Yuji's daughters had told me that you know, the one daughter I met said that they they would go to his house and, and Jiddu would play with her as a little girl, and they would go to concerts together. And so clearly, Yuji had a real one-on-one -on -one discussion with this guy. Um, he had his own version of talking about that, but I was I think that my obsession with Jiddu Krishnamurti gave me a kind of uh, a road inward to Yuji. 
my fascination with him or my my whatever. How I came to him was through that, I'm sure of it. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, my feeling is that with Yuji and JK, that Yuji, once once this calamity hit, where where the questioning business of seeking stopped, his uh, obsession with JK was was over. What kind of calamity? I th my sense is that the calamity, as he described it, was the point where if thinking shuts down in the human organism for one split second, if that thing is, if that continuity is broken, that uh, causes a kind of reshuffling of the system. It's like a reboot, I, th I think. This mm -hmm. is all my speculation, based on listening to him. My sense is that it's, uh, it's like a restructuring, after which you don't function at the service of your ideas, but those ideas operate in your life as a kind of tool. Like a pen that you pick up and put down, the thought is there available for you to use. Yeah. But you're not constantly writing to yourself, I'm looking at Willem de Ritter, I'm sitting at a table in Amsterdam and this is a brown table and it's made out of wood. And I'm not doing that all the time, well Yuji wasn't doing that all the time. But if you asked Yuji, what is what is this? He would say it's a table. What color is it? It's brown. But what he was trying to convey is that for him, while sitting idle, he didn't need to constantly tell himself, I'm sitting with Willem de Ritter, this yeah. is a table, it's hard, and, whereas I do that all the time. And he said that's the only difference between us. Somehow the continuity, if it's ever broken, will put you in a situation where you no longer know all the time what's happening. Right. Because this knowing mechanism is actually the memory imposing the definitions of table, Willem, Lewis, Holland, conversation, enlightenment. All these are being imposed on this organism continuously. And if this thing that stops for one second and reboots, then that won't be happening all the time. You'll be sitting there and looking around like he would do. In an idle moment, he, you'd find him looking at things or, you know, just if the light changes over there, he'd look at that movement. We had thoughts probably. No, and, and this is the thing that I think people walk right past that, him. Because what's sold to us is the image of the enlightened Swami who is like, speaks very soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He moves slowly. He spouts wisdom in the most poetic way. And he's very kind and deeply full of shit. And he wants your money. And he'll get it from you. And maybe he'll sleep with your wife, too, while he's at it. So Yuji was shouting at people and, you know, looking at, look at that thing over there, reading the signs, like a little kid. Yeah. Just responding to what's going on, naturally. Yeah. Without any pretense. Any utterance of pretense around that guy would, would merit a nice, solid blast. Shut up, bastard. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't be a German. What do you think? You know everything. You always have to be right. So... He had that quality because, and he was very clear in his explanation of it. But what I have realized since meeting him, and since his death even, and my obsession goes on, because here's a guy who's not, he's not being tortured by this ideology thinking mechanism anymore. Yeah. How the hell did he do that? So I listen to him talk, and I hear a guy who says, if this is very simple, people. It's just that I'm not using thought all the time, that's all. Yeah. And then I hear the response to that, which is all of the baggage of whatever that individual has at their arsenal to defend their worldview, that enlightenment means you have to meditate for a certain period, then you have to have these experiences, then you have to behave that way, and why didn't you do this, UG? And why did you do that, UG? And how do I do this, UG? Yeah, yeah. And not listening to what he was saying. Yeah. 
or even seeing what he was actually doing. I'm still interested in the calamity. Yeah? When, how old was he when it happened? He was 48 years old. 49? 49. 49. Multiples of 7. Yeah. 49. I'm horrible with numbers. And I believe, this is my speculation, because I, he used to tease me. He said, you're an FBI agent. I'm an American. <laughs> I guess I look like a cop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was fascinated. Okay, he meditated. He had all his spiritual experiences. And then he became obsessed with this notion, what is enlightenment? If it's such a thing, what is that state of mind? What does that look like? The only example that he knew of that might be in that state was Jiddu Krishnamurti. Because as he said, I inherited three things from my grandfather. A lot of money, the Theosophical Society, and Jiddu Krishnamurti. Yeah. Yuji blew through all of his money. Then he lost his family. Then he... During that process, he dropped out of the Theosophical Society as a lecturer. But here's a guy who knew all the traditional, he, between the ages of 14 and 21, he did all the yogic meditation. Yeah, right. He had a guru in the traditional way. At the age of 21, he goes and meets Ramana Maharshi. He meets someone who seems authentic and whom he only spent one day with. But yeah. later he said, that man helped me to formulate this question, what is that state and how can one be in it? If that guy's enlightened, I'm just a, I'm a human being like him. I was born from a woman. How, what's the difference? So the question was there. And for whatever reason, Jiddu Krishnamurti was in his path. He believed that guy had it. So he kept on going and going and going to listen to that man speak while he asked himself this question, what am I doing here? Why am I listening to him? What is this feeling that I have of silence? And he seems to have gone through some very... Uh, not very, but some uh, some experiences which indicate a person who's on that track will go through these things. The headlessness is one. Uh, a kundalini experience seems to be some part of this, which has to do with the chakras. And there's a lot of material out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. He describes that this happened to him. He didn't really know what it was, and someone explained later that must have been this. And then he. And how long did it last? I have no idea. No idea. I think a few hours. A few hours, but he was not, not going to the hospital or... Uh, no, no. Yuji would never resort to those things. No, no, no. I mean, what's great is that he had a great background in the Indian traditions. Yeah. So he knew about these things. Yeah, right. I mean, that experience happened when he was down and out in London after his family was broken up. He was alone and penniless in London, and he went to the Ramakrishna mission for shelter. And they gave him a job helping edit the centennial edition of the Vivekananda newspaper. So he had a little job for the first time in a long time, and he was going into the meditation room and asking himself, why are these people all meditating? You're not going to get anything. This is all bullshit. Yeah. And then he started to feel this sensation in his body, which he later said that must have been a Kundalini because the, the energy was cycling through the penis and the top of the head in this yeah. kind of rotation. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. describes the whole thing. And then he said, well, you know, but the thing I like about Yuji is, okay, that happened. He didn't go out and start peddling that. He didn't say, I'm Yuji Krishnamurti, you want to, uh, for $10, I'll teach you how to have a Kundalini experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what most people do. Yeah. Instead, he did whatever he did there, and he went on. Yeah. It wasn't finished for him. So he... He carried on for some time, then he met this Swiss lady as he was totally broke. He was in Switzerland then trying to find an account that he had opened years before with some money, and he was run out of money. He went to the Indian consulate and said, look, I think I have to go back to India. I'm broke. Yeah. The Swami looked at his little notebook of clippings, and he said, oh, you, how did you end up like this? And this lady overheard the conversation, and she was a quite radical individual herself, not interested in seeking, but interested in this Indian fellow. Yeah. She said, look, I can make it possible for you to stay here. So he begins traveling with this older Swiss lady. She takes care of him, and he goes every summer to hear J.K. talk in Sonnet. And he continues this examination of himself, and he's talking with the other people who are going to these talks, talking about Jiddu Krishnamurti. Yuji even says in one of the tape discussions that he was, he had written a commentary 
on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras in the light of Jiddu Krishnamurti's teaching. Of course, that's long lost now. It gives an idea of what his, the level of his fascination, both with the Yoga Sutras and what that may have meant, and with this man's teaching. So here's a guy who's dead seriously pursuing this stuff. He's now lost his family. He's lost his money. He's at the mercy of some lady yeah. who's putting him up. Yeah. As far as I can tell, there was no sexual relationship there. I've met people who claim there was. My sense is it's unlikely. He was yeah. a handsome young 40-year-old man, and she was 65. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And interesting, but not that interesting. No. Anyway, who knows? But yeah, I never know. Who the parties are all gone now. No way to prove anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he describes being in the tent in 1967 while Jiddu Krishnamurti was dis discussing the comparative mind. And he said, Yuji relates this in a tape with this fellow Heislop in 1968. It's on record there and it's in one of the books. He says that Jiddu was describing his, Yuji said he, it was as if he was describing my state of mind. He said, if you've been listening and following along, you will experience a silence. And then he said, if there's a silence, how do you know that silence? There was a comparative mind. And Yuji said, I suddenly felt like I'd been fooling myself. Yeah. For 40 years, I think I'm in some state. Now I've been pursuing this thing, and now I'm telling myself I'm in a silent mind. How do I know? If I'm calling it silence, that means there's still some entity in there observing all this. So yeah. I'm still caught. And then Jiddu goes on and says, in that silence, there is an energy. And in that energy, there is some action. And, but what that action is, you can't know. And you just said, I guess not, yeah. So he gets up and he needs to tent. And that was the end of the talk. And he went and sat on a bench. And he said what happened was that he, this question went round and round and round and stopped. This, this questioning, what is that state? He said, finally, I thought, well, I guess I'm in the state of Jesus or Buddha or one of those guys. The thing I was always after, yeah. that one thing... Here it is now. Now how the hell do I know I'm in that state? Yeah, exactly. So that doesn't make any sense. So then the whole thing stopped. And he went home and apparently went into a, uh, some kind of a situation where he was lying on the couch and this aperture of consciousness, I'm using, I'm painting you a picture now, Willem, from books that I've read. This is second-hand information. Tertiary, third-hand. <laughs> and he laid there and this thing closed down and he resisted this closing because it felt like the end. He said, it really felt like this is the end of everything and I cannot let that go. Yeah. And it stopped. And then um, Valentine was quite concerned. What the hell is going on with this guy? Because there were symptoms of some other condition. Who's Valentine? The woman, the Swiss lady. Oh yeah, Swiss lady, Valentine. There were some things happening prior to this, which Yuji was saying, like, you have this energy on his body where his skin would f would flare up like uh, sparks. Yeah. And he thought it was his polyester shirt. Yeah. And then he would lie in bed, and he would roll around in bed, and there would be these sparks. Or he would be taking a bath, and it was painful, the electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kind of electrical whatever. You know, all these things, I can understand why later he refused to talk about it because it sounds all very, you know, this is the stuff that people want, but this is the magic trick. So anyway, he goes home, basically, sounds like what they describe in the traditional Hindu texts, if you poke through all the nonsense, is that a person will die at some point and be reborn. Yeah. And the death, it sounds like, is when the continuity of thought is cut. That rebooting, maybe, is what happens. This is my guess. It sounds, from his description, the body went into the bow posture, and his friend came over and said, Yuji, what's going on? Because Valentine called this young kid Douglas and said, what's, Yuji's acting very strangely. Can you come over? So he comes over and he kind of, Yuji, wake up. What's happening? And he said, Yuji was like, uh, in a kind of daze. He just stared out the window or something. And yeah. What he described is that, look, this is the end of all of the searching 
will put you in a place where you don't know what's happening. That's why everyone is terrified of it. Yeah, right. And when I hear people tell their little cute story of how they were awakened, or now they're an enlightened being, and yeah, you know, yeah. they still have their job, and their house, and their wife, and their kids, and their dog, and they go for walks, and they can hold... What's wrong with that? Why do you have to be so severe? Look, if, if all of that shit comes to an end, you think you're going to pick and choose? Like as if you can carry on as if nothing happened. Yeah, right. And you're just going to go out and give a discourse now. Yeah. I, it just is so unconvincing. So when I read this account, and the way he told it was in, a, in a, the most basic way that he could communicate, Yuji attempted from the beginning to the end, to make this very simple and clear and not mysterious. Yeah. Look, saying, if the thing stops, this is why people avoid really listening or, or looking at things, because if that stops, it's the end of all of the things that you cherish and all the things you're afraid of. But most importantly, you lose what you think you have. And that's the worst fear you have. Your fear is what drives you. Yeah. You thrive on fear. And if someone were to take that fear away, that's the end of you. So for most people, this is, uh, what kind of sales pitch is that? Why do I want that? Yeah. I want to be happy. I want enlightenment. I want to have a blissful life. Yeah, right. right. So fine. So I give you 20, you give me 25 bucks, I'll show you how to be blissful. Yeah, right. And then they feel like they, whatever you're saying, their hopes are pinned on you. So I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> this is close to the description of what, and I think with Yuji, what, what I really appreciated was that he tried his damnedest to make it simple, to explain that clearly. Look, if this does stop, if it slows down and stops, and you first see something clearly for the first time in your life, the futility of what you're doing occurs to you at a molecular level, that's the end of it all. Finish. Yeah. Now that is the clearest, most honest assessment of the situation that I've seen. Yeah. And maybe it just appeals to me, I don't know. But that seems real obvious to me. And the, the reason that there were maybe 10 or 15 people around him at any given time. Yeah. Because the truth is not popular. The fake is very popular. Very. Right. Because it's comforting. You yeah. can turn it on and off. Yeah. You can have your awakening and still have your wife. Yeah. You know, whereas Yuji said, look, if you want to tell me you've had no time, no space, where is the space to fuck that bitch in his yeah. discreet way of putting it? <coughs> you know, then people carry on about how he's so severe and that's very Victorian and how can you, you know, why can't... Because they want to have their toys. Yeah. They want to take all the toys with them when they go. Yeah. And here's a guy, he's telling you the fact is, look, pal, first of all, you're not serious. If you were really serious... You wouldn't be asking that question. You know, I mean, if you look at the facts of Yuji Krishnamurti's life, he put himself in the corner and he was shoved deeper and deeper into that corner until the problem. He said, what do you want? If you want one thing, then you'll find it, you'll get it. But you want at least two. So he wanted one thing and he lost everything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the family, the money, all of it. And the thing that's unique about him is that he didn't run around trying to get it back. Right, right. He accepted it. Once it was gone, it was gone. There wasn't even a question of acceptance. Yeah. It wouldn't register on his radar. Yeah. He knew what it meant or what it was, but it didn't matter anymore. It had no, no meaning for him at all. No. People that come, I love this demand for meaning and significance. Because what I saw with him was meaning and significance are your torture chamber. That's exactly what people use to trap you and exploit you and the way you torture yourself for your entire life. Yeah. It's demand for meaning and purpose. Your heart doesn't need any meaning or purpose. It's pumping blood for fuck's sake. Yeah. Your lungs are pumping air. You're a living creature. Yeah. This meaning and significance is part of the machinery that we use to... Yeah fly airplanes, 
you know, drive automobiles, write books, make money. That demands meaning and significance. Yeah. But the body has no need for that. No. And in fact, the meaning and significance which we are demanding is a torture for this body. It's the cause for stress, anxiety, yeah, fear. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> no choice. It's no not even about choosing. I mean, this is the, the amazing yeah. thing to me about meeting Yuji was that it becomes a calibration for all this bullshit. Yeah. Now I understand why those things work the way they do. Yeah. All those silly things you used to say all the time, you know, that seem so simple-minded. Oh, my grandmother said that. Yeah, but did your grandmother live like that? No. Yeah. No. Here's a guy that lived with nothing. Yeah. You know, he had a million dollars in his bank account. And he gave away a hundred thousand dollars in chunks to girls for some ridiculous reason. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because the money was not an issue for him. No. I mean, you can argue all day long about it, but I saw it. You know, I saw how the guy lived. When I first met him, I wanted to know. I thought I'd photo photograph him for twenty-four hours. I always tell this story because it's so significant to me. I wanted to to record this example that I had seen. Because from, really, from the day I heard about the word enlightenment, whether it was Carlos Castaneda or whatever, I read Siddhartha in high school, you know, Herman Hesse's book, and then I went and saw the Zen paintings in the, in the university library, and I would and I would read the haikus and read stories about enlightened people. Yeah. So where the hell are they? Yeah. What would that look like? Yeah. Are they available anymore? Yeah. The Buddhism didn't attract me, too many rules. I grew up Catholic, it looked like another one. Then Jiddu came along, I thought, well, here's maybe this guy's like a Buddha, you know? Yeah. And that didn't work. So now I meet Yuji, and for, for some reason I'm, I'm just convinced this is what it looks like. So I want to make a record of it. Yeah. That's the first impulse, is like, show everybody. Yeah. Look here. Yeah. Then I thought, well, this is such an imposition. I don't Photograph the guy for 24 hours. What's the point? Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Well, within three years, he injured himself, and I ended up taking care of him for 24 hours a day for like eight weeks, which is when I started to write that book. So let's go back. You, you went to to um, to uh, Switzerland where mm. you saw him, right? And then after you stayed in Switzerland, or what? Or no, I went to visit for two weeks. And, and, then, and because of work, I was able to travel like that. Yeah. So then I came back to New York, and then in September of that year, this was July and August. Yeah. In September, I flew to India for a yeah. month. Yeah. I came back. I saw him for one week there. I came back, and then I was completely hooked. Yeah. And then I would work enough, and then I would save money, and I, would, I think the next place I went was to Palm Springs. He goes to Palm Springs. He went to Palm Springs every winter. Okay. For whatever reason. Yeah. And I thought, all right, I'm going to go there. So I saved my money. I went to Palm Springs for two weeks. Then the following fall, he came here to Amsterdam. I think that was 2003. I decided, fine, I'm going there. Yeah. I came to Amsterdam. Then that was a couple of weeks. Then that summer, it started in May. For the first time I had, I sublet my loft on, in New York, and I took three and a half months, this felt insane, to spend with him in, in Switzerland. Three and a half months? Three and a half months. Why did, why did you decide to sort of force him? Because I, he's so old now, Yeah. and I thought, this is the most interesting person I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, right. I'm so sick and tired and fed up with my life. Yeah. I got nothing better to do. What's better to do than to hang out with this guy? Yeah. To go to parties? To accelerate my career? To work more? To yeah. make more money? Yeah. No. This guy seemed to me the most interesting thing I'd ever seen. And he was old, and I thought, and I liked him also. I enjoyed his company. So I thought, I'm going to get on a plane, I'm going to go to Switzerland, I must be on my friggin' mind. The first week I was there, I had a fever. I was so anxious. What the hell did I do? Yeah. I'm hit, I'm sitting around in a room with people that are like have belonged to communes and they're religious nuts. Yeah. And they're strange people. I don't know. They have nothing to do with art. 
They have nothing to do with anything I'm interested in except him. Three and a half months of this. <laughs> and on the third day, we were sitting in the room with all these people. And I was joking with him. And he, he, I made some smart-ass comment, and he shoved this table toward me. You know, his, he would sit with his feet up on the table, and he pushed it. And then I thought, oh, all right. So I pushed it back at him. And then he shoved it at me, and then I shoved it back at him. <laughs> then he banged me into the counter behind me. Meanwhile, I wasn't watching all the other people in the room. But I was just joking around with him. I stood up and grabbed the table like I was going to flip it over. <laughs> this is, a, you know, the way he operated was to get you going and then push, push, push. Yeah. So I went a little, and, and I thought, oh, I, then I realized that the other people in the room were scared. Some of them yeah, were yeah, yeah. crying. Crying. Oh my God. I thought, <laughs> what have I done? I can't behave myself. I put the table, I sat down quietly, and I started thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> oh, I need to leave. i got to get out of here. This is stupid. Why did, why did I do this? Why did I, why did I come here? I can't even behave properly. The answer to why is always a lie. <laughs> oh, my God. And these people are crying, and they're looking, and they must have thought I was some monster. Yeah, and, yeah, And I yeah. felt like one. Yeah, yeah. And the next day, I came in very sheepish, you know, and... And he was kind of sitting there on the other side of the room. And I was waiting, thinking, okay, I can always get a train back and get a flight, go back to New York, and this will be over with. And then, but why should just relax? <laughs> so I relaxed, and then, then it was over. You know, at some point it was over. But this business of joking with him eventually escalated. And I began, he was pushing more and more. He saw me do an imitation of someone once, you know, like imitating how somebody behaved. And then he wanted me to do it all the time. <laughs> and then singing songs, and then he pushed it, and he wanted it all the time. <laughs> like a little kid with a new toy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And pushing me, pushing me, pushing me all the time. And that started something that uh, eventually wound up with him. This, within a year, then he started smacking me on the head and pinching and punching. And then it would go on and on and on. We would, uh, anyway. <laughs> so, it's very interesting that, uh, that, He brings you back actually to how we start. Huh? As a kid, you don't have thoughts. Yes. As a kid, you're playing. Yeah. But we call that playing. Yeah. You know, like because everything, everything is interesting. You know, like. Yes. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh. And if we look at the kids, we love it. Yeah. But as soon as a grown up does this, he's crazy. Yeah. He's an idiot, and of course, it's it's taken away from you mm -hmm. that daydreaming and, and and dreaming and 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 being involved in like even the smallest little hole, and you go in it and you put your nose in it and ooh, <laughs> you know that's out of the question, and but he, see, he started yeah. doing that with you. you well, know? yeah, but I think I would, and of course, in the beginning. Yeah. You get totally upset. You think, what, what am I doing? I'm totally getting out of my mind. This is, I'm doing with the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm crazy. I have to go. You know, it's like as if, as if you, no, you know lose what? everything in your life, which basically is how you started he, as a kid. What he did was to unleash the, the natural inclination to do things that were fun. Right? Yes. And then this, this censorship operation in me in that instance, jumped in yeah. and said, ooh, what did I do wrong? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I reacted. And he doesn't, he's sitting there, he doesn't care what happened. No, exactly. It doesn't matter to him. As a kid, you don't either. No. And so after that incident, I was less inclined to back away. Right. Which led to even deeper trouble. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, because you're a grown-up, right? Well, but also he would then push that. Yeah. Because he saw the effect on the audience. Yeah. And his whole 
point, I think, toward the end was to drive people out of their comfort zone. Yeah. So that they could drop some of this pretense. Yeah, right. Um, there was an incident with children. He started sicking the kids on me. You know, whenever a child came in the room, he said, go beat that bastard up. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be fine for a while. Then the parents would step in. Yeah. Jimmy, don't do that, Jimmy. Yeah. Jimmy, don't. Oh. Uh. Exactly. And at some point, I would also, like, there was one incident in Switzerland where it was a room full of people. It was the height of the season, as it were, with Yuji. All of his old friends who came. Yeah. There were about 30 people in this big living room. Yeah. And there was a family there, and there was a young boy about maybe five or maybe, I don't know how old he was. And I had been, you know, the thing with Yuji had accelerated now to where he was punching me, kicking me, throwing yeah. water. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. I was so bored with this oh, holy business shit yeah, exactly. of people sitting around. You know, that I was kind of like, okay, let's, you know, I think he picked up, whatever. So this kid comes in, he says, get him. And so I'm bored, I'm thinking, oh, he's dead. So I'm on the floor, and the kid's pounding, 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 pounding. And usually saying, more, more. And the father is leaning over saying, stop it. And the kid is pound, pound. <laughs> and at some point I thought, now it's enough. Yeah. Now I've had enough. Yeah. So I got up and Yuji came over and grabbed me by the collar. He said, now you sing. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, screw you. And I gently detached his tough little hand and took off out of the room. And the little kid was traumatized. And Yuji said, it's your fault. So everybody in the room is now like, what the hell just happened here? <laughs> you know, I mean, I was enjoying, I have to say, I was enjoying this little game because I felt like I was stirring up these other people. And then he kind of, it's like he caught that and then he grabbed me and put me on the spot. You know, like, oh, you think you're... Then I said, okay, that's enough, and I left. And these were moments where, I mean, I have to say, I left there and I thought, I am not, this is enough. Yeah. I think this has got to stop. I can't do this anymore. And I went home and I just was stewing there like, I screw this old fucker. I'm not going back in there. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then he, of course, calls and I don't answer the phone and he sends somebody over to get me. Is he okay? You know, make sure you bring him back. And I was like, screw him. I'm not going back there. But then again, <laughs> as with all of these incidents, you know, and there were more than one of those, the question comes up, what do you want? Yeah, exactly. Why was I there in the first place? Exactly. To get rid of all of these controls. Exactly. And here's a guy, he's pushing me to get rid of them. Yeah. And there's my resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back and have a safe, comfortable existence in my boring, shit-ass life in New York? Yeah. Who cares? Exactly. For me, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing more interesting than that kind of existence that I saw in front of me. Nothing. And so when people are confused and they read this book and they feel sorry for me, I don't care. I don't give a shit. If they don't get it, then they will never get it. They would never understand it. You know, if I say to somebody, look, if Jesus Christ, even if you're an atheist, if somebody tells you, okay, Jesus got off the plane, he'll be in New York, he's going to be at Starbucks at 7 with some friends, would you not at least be curious? Like, <laughs> if it was a convincing report that Jesus Christ or Mohammed or somebody, like they're going to show up, you're going to at least be able to say, look, you asshole, you ruined my life, you know? Something. <laughs> Like, you phony piece of shit. You Look what you've done to civilization. Something. You want to go in there and confront this. Get to the bottom of it. Ah, I don't think so. Or it sounds like I'm a religious fanatic, or I'm putting him on the same level. You know? Yeah, exactly. So fine, I don't care. I don't really care. Because what I saw convinced me that I always wondered if those... Are there... Is that possible even for a human being, or is that all a big story? Is this Jesus story a big story? It must have been something about the guy, but you know, maybe it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. but what is it really like? I mean, people can tell me endless things. I thought J.K. had something. I went to see him, and frankly, I was bored. Who? 
Jay, Jiddu Krishnamurti. Oh, yeah, Jiddu. Yeah. You know, I read his book and I had a funny experience of, yeah. of some kind of awareness of this feeling. But then I was the same idiot afterwards, so who cares? Yeah. And then I read his books for 20 years and nothing more happened. Nothing more happened. I went to see him and nothing yeah. happened. Yeah. So what's the yeah. big deal? Yeah. I meet this Yuji Krishnamurti. It's a different situation. Yeah. It's totally different. And yeah. you cannot mistake the difference. I could not mistake it. This guy is, is out of it. He got out. He escaped. I don't care who says what. That guy, I can see it. And the way he acts, so what am I going to, why would I not be interested in that? Yeah, exactly. And if you run away from it, uh, it's going to, the rest of my life I'd be thinking, you're stuck. Yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. I pussied out. I ran away. I gave up. I chickened out. Yeah. Yeah, but those, those are, those are, uh, Big, big confrontations. Fine, good. Yeah, of course. Bring it on. Great, the best. That's what I'm saying. Like I, I yeah. realize nobody else in my life would put me in that corner. Exactly. I wouldn't put up exactly. with that for one minute. Yeah, exactly. So if somebody goes, why would you put up with that? It's like, well, if you don't understand it, then fine. I can't yeah. explain it to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, that's just like Milarepa and Boo Boo. I don't give a shit about Milarepa. I, this is my life we're talking about here, not somebody's book. Yeah. I met a guy who had this effect. It's not related to those things. No. I mean, after the fact, you can do whatever you want with the information. But in the moment, that information is not in operation. And so you, that's what was fascinating. So you went back again. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Until he died, Willem. Yes. At yeah. some point, I, I realized, like, okay, this guy's getting really old. I helped him when he fell. Then he was leaning on me a lot and beating me up and punching me. And then I thought, he's going to die soon. He's not going to last much longer. Yeah. So the hell with this apartment. I got kicked out of my apartment in New York. Okay. Put everything in storage. I was able to keep working because I did this freelance work and yes. traveling. Yeah. So I said, fine, this isn't going to last forever. Yeah. What, and there's nothing more pressing. So I'll just keep with this until it's over. And you went to? Where was he? Uh... Wherever he went. Oh yeah. You, you kept following him. Chicago. I'm uh, sorry, Chicago. New York. La, um, Palm Springs. Palm Springs, New York, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, India, back to, the, back to Switzerland. So you traveled with him? Uh, then I just started traveling all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then I watched, you know, it's this, he's not going to last much longer. He was yeah. hobbling a little bit, and I thought, okay, how is he going to deal with death? Yeah. How is he going to, that's a big test. Yeah. How does somebody behave? Yeah. And the answer was exactly the same. Precisely the same. No doctors, no medicine, nothing. He fell a second time when we were in, in Northern Italy. Then he asked me again, you got to help me out. I spent, you know, all night with him, keeping the fire, giving him water, helping him take a leak, yeah. whatever. And he didn't change. Nothing changed. Till the last second that I saw him, when he kicked me out and said, look, you time to go. You know, go on, carry on your own life. Get out of here. Uh, until that moment, that was it. You know, I, I just stuck it out there until that was it. And I watched him lying there in bed for eight weeks, not in bed, on a couch. Yeah. And the only thing he was doing was describing how he functioned. Yeah. And then I realized that's all he's ever done. Yeah. And everybody asked him, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? As if he shouldn't do it. Yeah, exactly. And he, you know, he had a pair of shoes, a pair of pants, a shirt. I went back to his apartment when, I, when he kicked us out two weeks before he died. Or one week before he died. Week one. one week. And I sat in his room in the apartment where he was. It sent a, sh a chill up my spine. Because the only indication, there was a calendar and a clock, and you open the refrigerator, there's one can of cream, a pair of shoes, a pair of slacks, that's it. That's oh, it. That's it. So all of these people talk about divesting themselves of this, that, and the other. But anyway, it's... He was also eating uh, quite... Uh, Hardly anything. Yeah, simple. Huh? Yeah, I mean, rice sticks and tomato sauce and idlis and, you know... I mean, his diet also... There were so many things about this guy that you could learn from. 
That first two weeks when I was in Switzerland with him, I had an epiphany going into the Migros. I went in there, and I looked around, and I thought, we don't need any of this crap. Really, all this business of vitamins and minerals and eat the right food and all this garbage is a pitch. Yeah. There's a horse running in that field. What does that horse eat? Hay. Yeah. How come that horse is so huge and those powerful muscles and it's eating hay? Yeah. And we need vitamin B, niacin, rhioflavin, whatever they can invent to, to inject into that stuff they call food we're eating. Yeah. And it's all in our head. Yeah. Similarly, clothing, food, shelter, he would say if all of you, if all you need is food, clothing, and shelter, it's not very difficult to obtain. No. If you want one thing more than that, you are in a neurotic state. I cannot find the evidence to suggest otherwise. It was not complicated what he was saying. It was not complicated no. at all. But it's extraordinarily difficult for this organism, having been shuffled through the machinery of the society, and with all the thousands of years of momentum, as we were talking about language, yeah. How language has produced a stranglehold of thought in yeah. this organism yeah. Yeah. And, and given us all kinds of illness as a result. Yeah. Chronically. Yeah. And the same language generator is creating more and more problems under the claim of solutions. Yeah. Whether they're spiritual, you know, meditate more, do this, do that. Whatever. Yeah, if you read a newspaper in the morning, you don't really get very, uh, very happy. No? <laughs> no, because they learned when they began publishing newspapers yeah. that the only news that sells is bad news. Bad, yeah. Because we love fear and thrive on anxiety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's amazing. If you don't have a problem, you invent one. Yeah. I mean, he used to repeat that. And then people, of course, the first thing, well, what about the starving people? And look. And you know what's so interesting? The word problem comes from the Greek word problema. You know what it means? That's what's right in front of you. What? That's, That's what the meaning of the word problem. Is That's what is right in front of you. <laughs> Everything and is we a call problem. It, we then. call it a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. What's right in front of you. Yeah. What's right in front of you. Yeah. Because what you recognize and the recognizing thing is the problem. Yeah. And it generates solutions which continue the problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes it... And if you take away the problem, then the threat is death for that thing. Yeah. It means that comes to an end. Yeah. Yeah. He's... Uh... And, and so the, the last week he, he, uh, he sent you out and yeah. he, you, you, you didn't see him die or no. so? How, uh, who was there then? Nobody? Uh, a filmmaker uh, and a man and his wife who had known Yuji for about 20 some years. Okay. She was a doctor and he was... Uh, so she, I think, you know, it was a wise decision because she could, she was a doctor. She would at least say, oh yeah, he's dead now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. And Mahesh wanted to be there at the end. Yeah. Manage the filmmaker. And he filmed it? No. Oh, okay. But uh, he wrote a book about it called Taste of Life. And uh, when I read that book, the transcript or the manuscript of it, I had been wondering, you know, did I miss something? And when I read it, I realized, no, everything was the same until yeah. he breathed his last. Yeah, yeah. So you wrote a book too? Yeah. The Goner. Goner. Goner, <laughs> which means literally? It means terminal, finished, no help, you know, you're dying, yeah. that's yeah. it, yeah, it's that's over, it. Yeah. bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Slang. <laughs> they usually like that word, he, he called it the Goners Club at one point, he established the Goners Club <laughs> and raised 10,000 euros in 20 minutes in the Black Forest in Germany. And then he disbanded it because he didn't want to vote for the president or something. I don't know. <laughs> he invented it, raised a bunch of money, and then said, okay, forget it. Yeah, forget it. Yeah. But he liked American underground slang. Yeah. So that word goner seemed like a good title for me. Yeah. I liked it. It's got a nice ring to it. The yeah. Indians, of course, didn't like it. 
So when they published the book in India, they published it. They wanted a different title. So they call it No More Questions. No More Questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I threw out a bunch of suggestions, and they took that. And then they didn't want my picture of him as an old, toothless man. <laughs> so they found a vigorous photograph of the handsome young Eugene, you know, <laughs> with teeth and dark hair, who I yeah, never saw. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's all part of the BS machine, <laughs> you know. So, now, yeah, amazing, amazing, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, I felt too when, uh, when I talked with him that there was just a beautiful stream going, you know, yeah. a beautiful flow, you know, that, that felt really totally natural and, and could go any way, you know, and it was yeah. like indeed... Unpredictable. Uh, yeah, the, the, the absolutely unpredictable, fantastic, you know, and indeed, you know, if we were able to bring that back in our life, the, the playing, the being as a kid, you know, because the moment you, you learn how to think, you know, all our thoughts are mostly lies, mm. and, you know, and, and we have not one original thought of ourselves. We keep repeating and repeating and repeating whatever they teach us, you know what I mean? And the interesting thing, of course, is that if you go to another country, it's other thoughts. But they basically have the same function. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. That's yeah. what I've discovered. Yeah. Different explanations. Yeah. For the same thing. Explanation isn't for the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All human drive is the same. Yeah. I mean, I think that yeah. was the best thing about going to India with Yuji was that my fascination for Hinduism and Vedic scriptures and all that was very much balanced by seeing that it doesn't operate in these people's lives at all. Yeah. As, uh, other than as ritual. Yeah. The, the few, select few, for whom that operates, those texts themselves are not necessary. No. But it's a nice record and it's an interesting society, or yeah. culture. The society is just like every other one. Yeah. But the culture fascinates me. But again, yeah, sure. nothing like the living individual who was in front of me who was finished with all that. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and, I, and for that I am eternally happy to have met and encountered and gone ahead and spent that time just to convince myself, yeah. yes, okay. So is there interest for your book? I think it's a limited interest, you know. Yeah. I don't I don't expect I cannot imagine the aside from maybe the fascination with the bizarreness of the situation, yeah. you know, that it would be that big, but I did feel really compelled to tell that story. Because yeah. I feel that so many stories of these people get distorted and turned into exactly. fairy tales. Yeah, I know, I know. And also the difficulty of confronting that in your life, that it wasn't a pretty picture for me to hang out with him. Yeah. You know, it was humiliating and difficult, but for good reason, you know. I, I was there because I wanted to be done with these things. And yeah. They don't go easily. Yeah. Nothing goes without a fight. <laughs> you know? um, okay. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Nice talk. Nice to meet thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was very nice to hear your story, it gave me a very beautiful view of this wonderful man who yeah, actually something. was teaching us to become a kid again. And <laughs> yeah, to become, to, yeah. Maybe to become an adult for the first time, actually. For the first, yeah, exactly, you know what I mean? Because it's like, possible, which yeah. is doubtful, but he did give it his shot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Thank you. <laughs>